costing $106 to $128 per pound, king and snow crabs might be the best crabs you'll ever taste. After harvest, they're quickly transported to St. Paul, Alaska, home to the world's largest crab processing plant. During peak season, this facility can produce an astounding 50,000 to 500,000 pounds of crab daily. Machines process up to 40 crabs per minute, separating edible parts from the main body. These sections are then sorted by size and packed into 45-pound containers. Next, crabs undergo an 18-minute cooking process at 210 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by a cooling bath. To preserve flavor for up to two years, crabs are soaked in 92% saltwater brine, then quickly rinsed. Finally, processed crab is packed in 45-pound bags and boxes, stacked and frozen. The factory produces 6,000 to 8,000 boxes daily, thanks to 320 dedicated workers. Live or fresh blue crabs with pH 6.8, 7.2 are best for top quality canned crab. At the factory, crabs are carefully cleaned to remove dirt and bacteria from shells. Then they peel the crabs, remove excess, and rinse them again with water. Some facilities would skip this step and steam or boil them whole. After steaming, the crabs are removed and cooled. They are then taken to skilled workers for careful meat extraction. This is done manually with special tools to separate meat from body and claws. Any unwanted bits, shell pieces, or spoiled meat are removed. The extracted crab meat is carefully sorted and inspected before packaging. In 2023, global consumption of fresh canned crab reached $17 billion. Sashimi is one of the most famous tuna dishes from Japan. Some tuna are gutted right at the shore, but they are very expensive. Some can cost over $500,000. However, most sashimi in mid-range restaurants is thawed frozen tuna. These tuna were frozen right after being caught, so they are still very fresh. Each fish is weighed and recorded. Tuna of similar weights are placed in the same cage until cutting. The tuna is sliced at the tail and thawed to assess its quality. After that, each fish is cut. Workers must be very careful as the cutting machine is extremely sharp. First, the fish is cut into four parts. Then, each part is trimmed more carefully. The tuna's skin is also scraped off because it's not used for sashimi. Japan catches about 102,000 tons of tuna yearly. Over 60% is cut and frozen this way for sashimi. The brownish part of the fish is scraped off. Then the fish is cut into smaller pieces as requested by the customer. Finally, the fish pieces are packed in refrigerated boxes and delivered to restaurants. Though famous in Japan, Indonesia is actually the world's largest tuna producer. They're estimated to produce about 18% of the global tuna catch. Japan's canned seafood industry is growing, with mackerel leading the way. The mackerel arrives at the factory where it's first rinsed in cold water. They're then steamed, with cooking time adjusted based on the fish's size and quantity. Once cooked, the mackerel is cooled and dried. Workers then manually clean the fish, removing the skin and bones. Skin, head, red meat and bones. 
Based on customer orders, the mackerel is cut into large pieces or shredded flakes. The cut mackerel is then packed into cans. Each can is weighed and x-rayed to detect unwanted metal and improper mackerel parts. Vegetable oil, brine, and sometimes flavorings are added before sealing and cleaning. Sealed cans undergo high temp sterilization to preserve the mackerel. After cooling, cans are labeled and packaged, ready to ship within a week. In 2021, Japan exported 434,400 tons of mackerel, led by Ibaraki and Nagasaki. The U.S. is the world's largest producer and consumer of turkeys. On Thanksgiving, their main holiday, Americans consume about 46 million turkeys. When turkeys reach the desired weight, they're loaded onto trucks via conveyor belts that keep them upright without crushing. The unloading process happens almost entirely in the dark to keep the turkeys calm. They're then hung from hooks and stunned with electricity. Stunning makes them lose sensation and become unconscious instantly. Afterward, they're passed over a sharp blade for bleeding. Turkeys are placed in a machine for scalding in hot water and having their feathers plucked by its brushes. Workers then cut open the body and a specialized machine processes the turkey's internal organs. This large California turkey facility can process up to 60,000 turkeys per hour. Gizzards, a popular part, require skilled workers to process them. These organs are sorted, machine separated, and quickly chilled before packaging and sale. They are then sent to a cutting machine to separate the legs from the body. Some facilities keep the legs intact and cut other parts first. For remaining carcasses, workers check external quality while machines inspect internally. Turkey carcasses are then sent to the packing team for whole packaging. But some facilities process them into smaller pieces. Whole turkeys go to a carving machine where heads are removed and washed to clean remaining blood. They are then deboned and cut into various parts for packaging and consumption. Snakes are typically harvested for meat when they are about 6 months to a year old. To be considered high quality, they must weigh at least 1.1 kilograms. Only male snakes are used for meat, while females are kept for breeding. After being killed, the snakes are carefully processed. Their internal organs are removed and the skin is stripped off whole. The meat is thoroughly cleaned and cut into pieces. Known for its lean, slightly sweet taste, snake meat is a popular exotic delicacy. China processes about 14 to 18 million pounds of snake meat annually. About 40% of that ends up on people's plates. Snake soup, a traditional Chinese dish, is said to prevent colds and boost health. In 2023, China's snake village sold over 3 million snakes to pharma companies. These firms use snake gallbladders and skins for health supplements worldwide. But it's the snake venom that's truly prized. Called liquid gold in China, this potent toxin can fetch up to $750 per gram. The waters around Indonesia are incredible, teeming with healthy fish and small squid schools. 
thousands of seafood species call these seas their home. It's also a hotspot that fishermen don't want to miss. Now let's see how Indonesian fishers catch millions of tons of seafood. Indonesia boasts the world's second longest coastline. The underwater scenery is breathtaking, with coral reefs housing the world's largest lobster variety. Pantai Gesing Town sits on central Java's volatile southern coast. Here, fishermen often focus on lobster catching for about three months yearly. Of course, they still must adhere to certain quota regulations. Typically, catching lobsters under 300 grams or 8 centimeters in shell length is prohibited. Lobsters are caught using various fishing methods throughout the year. In Indonesia, lobster fishermen mainly use specialized nets or traps. This basic fishing method is done using small boats. For Pantai guessing fishermen, catching lobsters is quite simple. They only need to go to the nearby bay to fish. They spend just about $8 on fuel per trip. Here, fishermen often use nets as the sea is too deep for traps. Lobsters caught in traps are usually still alive. So fishermen can only keep those above the size limit. But lobsters caught in nets often die when removed. The number of lobsters caught in nets isn't large. Removing lobsters from nets is quite challenging. Fishermen must be skilled to keep lobsters intact for high prices. They're also gentle with the net to avoid tears, as the catch heavily depends on its quality. Lobsters are kept in seawater to maintain their freshness and meat quality. Most fishing boats are equipped with preservation gear. This crucial step determines the selling price of all their lobsters. After capture, the lobsters are placed in mesh bags. They're resubmerged in seawater to keep them alive and fresh until landing. The catch is plentiful and the lobsters are high quality. Traders can purchase them for $20 per kilogram. Indonesia is a key player in the global seafood industry, focusing on tuna and squid. The country's squid industry has boomed, catching 95,000 tons by 2023. Squid feed at night, so fishermen use bright lights to lure them to the surface. Green lights are especially effective for fishing. Indonesian squid fishing vessels often move in groups of 20 to 30 ships. Squid in this area are surrounded by bright lights all night long. Traditional techniques are also among the best for commercial fishing. Squid are caught using jigs on fishing lines, often from small boats 12, 15 miles off Medan's coast. Some fishermen catch squid by pulling the line. This is one of the most popular techniques for catching squid. Anglers cast the bait and wait for it to reach the bottom. Then they pull the rope, raising and lowering the fishing line. You can pause briefly to let the bait sink slowly before pulling it up. This technique keeps the bait moving, attracting squid. When hooked, squid don't struggle much, so there are few signs but anglers will feel the fishing line become slightly heavier. Anglers must reel in carefully as tentacles can slip off if pulled too hard. It is crucial for successful squid fishing. You must prep bait based on color and light reflection. Bait color can make or break a squid fishing trip. 
Three days at sea can yield about 300 kilograms of squid. Banca Belletung fishers prefer squid. Easy catch, high profit. Indonesia's tuna catches 16% of global supply year-round. In 2023, 790 K tons of tuna caught, worth $1.7 billion. Yellowfin and skipjack are the top tuna targets. These tuna are most common from May to October. Large tuna schools are often found in deep waters. During spawning season, abundant tuna from the Indian and Pacific Oceans return to the Indonesian archipelago's shallow, nutrient-rich waters. This environment is ideal for tuna growth and reproduction. It's also the prime time for tuna fishing and marketing. Fishermen primarily use purse seines for catching. They gauge currents and wind direction by the boat's movement. The net is typically set diagonally along the waterline. Once nets and buoys are deployed, fishermen achieve initial success. Floating buoys create an enclosure in the water. A massive trap lies beneath the sea's surface. The tuna are unaware they're swimming into a fishing net. When fishermen pull the net, all tuna are brought aboard. Tuna are hoisted onto the ship using a crane and conveyor system. To ensure quality, tuna is immediately stored in cold chambers to preserve the fish's freshness. Fishermen must spend weeks at sea searching for tuna schools. Tuna swim fast and far making it challenging to cast and pull nets. Fishermen work in harsh conditions, storing tuna at low temps to maintain quality. Indonesian fishing isn't known for luxury boats or popular spots. Yet it still offers adventure for fishermen. The thrill comes from chasing and catching giant marlins. Marlins inhabit coastal waters, from coral reefs to continental shelf edges. Known for speed and fierce fights, marlins test even the toughest rods. Thus, marlin fishing has a low success rate. They're also masters of escape. Anglers should learn tricks to save time and money on their fishing trips. Every year, marlins migrate along the coast, following warm tropical waters southward. During migration, marlins stop to feed in areas where bait fish are plentiful. Fishermen focus their efforts in these spots to get the best fishing results. Marlin can be caught using various fishing techniques, depending on the location. In Indonesia, ships often catch marlins using large nets. After choosing a suitable spot, the fishermen will cast their nets. The net is left in the sea for about four to six hours. Afterward, the fishermen begin pulling in the net to check their catch. If lucky, they'll find giant marlins in their haul. Marlin are quite heavy, so it takes four to five fishermen to pull in each net. They work together to control and remove the marlin from the net. For safety, fishermen may cut off the marlin's sharp bill. This bill is a weapon that can injure fishermen. Then, they'll clean the fish and remove debris to prepare it for preservation. Some crew members will transfer the fresh marlin to the storage area. Moving the fish to the hold is also a challenging task.